Uh, well, thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk this afternoon. I mean, obviously, we're all living in a somewhat strange world at the moment. Uh, but I wanted to really speak for maybe 25 minutes about synthetic biology, which, is Rod has, which Rod has, as Rod has said, is a passion of mine. Uh, I've been working in this field pretty much from the beginning, which was about 20 years ago. So I wanted to start off with uh, this uh, painting, which is one of my favorites, which is by Joseph Turner, Rain, S Speed and Steam. 1844, which is um, just after the beginning of the coming of the railways. Uh, but in another sense, it represents um, the uh, effectively the early phase of the uh, high carbon economy. And what I will be talking about in a minute is, is a move towards the low carbon economy. But uh, nevertheless, the high carbon economy uh, has been a key driver of industrialization uh, for the last at least 150 years. So um, I don't want to make any assumptions this afternoon. So I wanted to start off by discussing what is synthetic biology. And uh, this uh, first slide on that theme shows that uh, synthetic biology revolves largely around uh, the manipulation of DNA, although later on this afternoon I will be talking about RNA. So DNA, which I'm sure pretty much everybody here this afternoon will know, is the um, basic building block uh, for the human body and other organisms and represents um, uh, in, its, uh, in its most complex form perhaps the, uh, the genome, the human genome. And it comprises, as shown in this slide, a series of uh, base pairs, as they're called, which are effectively the instruction set for the, in the case of humans, uh, for our bodies to produce various things, a whole range of things from skin cells to blood, etc., cetera, et cetera. Now, um, in molecular biology, there is something which is called the central dogma, which is shown on this slide. And this just shows that um, DNA uh, which is a double double stranded uh, set of uh, bases uh, is then uh, transcribed into RNA or sometimes called messenger RNA and then the messenger RNA eventually um, uh, programs the cell to produce uh, proteins and other uh, which then turn into entities as I say like uh, uh, skin cells etc. In uh, synthetic biology, what we do is to take the, 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 base, the bases, which are shown here, and uh, we combine them together in what are called bioparts. Now we can do this because uh, it is possible now to chemically synthesize uh, these, uh, these bioparts, these, these bases in any combination that we like. And what we then do is to um, Put, put these into a plasmid as it's called, and then the plasmid is inserted into a cell. And here I've shown an example of, uh, of E. coli, E. coli bacterium. And so we insert the plasmid which contains the human design DNA into the cell. And then that acts as a secondary um, instruction set to tell the cell to produce um, uh, products which are of human design as opposed to the, the natural products which I've already already talked about. And uh, it really relates back to um, around 2003, 2004, when although this, this slide shows an earlier phase of this where it became possible to actually um, uh, produce the DNA chemically. So this is uh, called DNA synthesis, and that's shown here in terms of the yellow uh, characteristic. Uh, the sequencing of the DNA, which is shown here in blue, uh, uh, progressed uh, somewhat earlier. Um, and it's this combination of uh, the ability to read DNA and then to produce it chemically, uh, which is the basis of, of synthetic biology. These uh, curves are what are called the Carlson, Carlson curves. And you can see another aspect of this is that uh, the, the, the cost of uh, sequencing DNA, reading it, and the cost of synthesizing it, as shown here, is rapidly coming down. And it's not only 
uh, it's not only coming down in price, but it's, it's going up more and more in terms of stability. So um, the basic components of uh, uh, synthetic biology uh, comprise a number of uh, biological components, which are shown here on the left-hand side. So promoters, ribosome binding sites, protein coding sequences, and terminators. And these are the components which we use to uh, produce what is called a gene circuit, which is the DNA that's then put, in, then put into the cell. Uh, so here again is the bio part. <clears throat> and over here on the right-hand side, we can see the um, hierarchy of synthetic biology, uh, which comprises the, uh, the, the uh, DNA, which, is, which comprises the, the parts, and then those parts uh, allow us to produce devices of various kinds, which then go into systems. <clears throat> so as I've already said, the, uh, the bio parts, the combination of bio parts, uh, represent an instruction set which goes into the cell to produce a product which is a product according to human design as opposed to a natural product and this as we'll see as we go through this afternoon allows you to produce um, a whole range of different different products using these kind of techniques so that's some background uh, to synthetic biology now let me give you some more general background in relation to the field and this slide uh, shows the, um, the basic industrial model, which has existed essentially since the middle of the 19th century. Uh, and this is uh, the basis of much uh, of our industry today and has been the case uh, for about 150 years. So it's based on, the model is based on oil-based feedstocks, or if you like oil, uh, which feeds through synthetic chemistry to industrial processes and products. And as you can see from the slide, uh, there are a whole range of different applications for this, but synthetic rubber uh, is one. So all car tires, lorry tires, et cetera, are based upon this, this model. Uh, this model is used a lot in the uh, um, microelectronics industry and also in the whole of the plastics, plastics industry. And so you can think of this as being, uh, if you like, a high, high carbon model. And we're going to talk about low carbon models in a moment. So products that are made using this non-sustainable carbon approach based on petroleum, coal, natural gas, et cetera, feeding through synthetic chemistry, produce the wide range of products that uh, we're all familiar with on a daily basis. But as I say, the basic problem is that uh, they are produced by non-sustainable carbon, uh, non-sustainable non -sustainable carbon model. And so we are now looking uh, worldwide at the need for a transition to a sustainable bio-based economy. And uh, you will have all have heard the, the British government statements about reaching zero carbon by 2050. Uh, well, this is all part of that, that drive. And indeed, um, as this uh, slide shows, which is uh, from the World Bank, uh, there are a series of uh, countries around the world that have already signed up to this. So on the left-hand side here, the, the hatched companies are the companies which have already signed up to um, uh, paying the carbon tax, et cetera. Other areas of the world, particularly um, China and in the East, uh, are still in the process of doing this. But nevertheless, uh, we, you know, we heard yesterday on the um, media that the Chinese government are now talking about reaching zero carbon uh, by 2060, which will be quite amazing. <clears throat> so all of this revolves around the need to develop a, uh, a bioeconomy. And the bioeconomy, the bio-based economy is a, an economy which, is, uh, which uses a new model for industry and the economy. It uses renewable biological resources to achieve sustainability in terms of food, energy, industrial goods, etc. And it exploits the untapped potential stored within millions of tons of biological waste and residual materials. And I'll show you some of this as we go through. So the drive here is now to apply synthetic biology for, a sustainable, for sustainable biomanufacturing. So instead of going through synthetic chemistry, we now go through synthetic biology 
to produce the range of products which are in everyday use. Of course, this represents the future. Uh, I mean, this is already happening as I'll show in terms of some examples, but it's going to take uh, two or three decades before we're going to be in a position where all of these uh, products are reproduced using this model rather than the, uh, the original model. Now, of course, the government, uh, the UK government, the US government and other governments around the world are very interested in this area. Uh, they're interested in it because it represents economic growth. And so there have been a series of UK government reports um, talking about how we uh, build the build the bioeconomy. So Biodesign for the Bioeconomy is one of the reports that I've been, I was involved in, in writing. And so the growing bioeconomy uh, is predicted in terms of these government reports to go from about 220 billion to 440 billion pounds by 2030. And that's, uh, that requires, of course, uh, the development of a, of a new industry, uh, which is now rapidly developing. And as you can see from this slide, uh, covers a range of different, different areas. And the whole point here is that it's based upon uh, a new model uh, for uh, uh, industrial processes, which uh, unlike what I've called here the 20th century uh, model based on oil-based feedstocks going through synthetic chemistry to industrial processes and products, is now based on bio-based feedstocks, and that could be bio-waste uh, going through synthetic biology now into industrial processes and products. And this is the, the model which um, uh, will develop and is developing over the next, in my opinion, 20 to 30 years to replace a lot of what goes on in terms of the original model. Now, the exciting thing about synthetic biology is that uh, we're now getting to a position whereby, as shown in this slide, we can e effectively um, copy other areas of, of technology, other areas of industry. So aerospace, where uh, model, a lot of modeling is done in terms of wind tunnels to produce uh, uh, aircraft uh, in the microchip area, in the computer area, uh, design using breadboards to produce um, uh, new computers, server farms, etc. And now, as shown on the uh, right hand side of the slide here, uh, we have something called the design build uh, test and learn cycle, which uh, is, the, is the modeling cycle that we use in terms of synthetic biology and more general biotech. So this whole field, and I'll show this uh, a bit later on, is now progressing much more towards uh, what we expect to see industrially. So just a quick word about uh, synthetic biology at Imperial. Uh, Imperial is one of the main uh, centers, uh, actually it's a main, I would say it's a leading in international center for synthetic biology. And nowadays we are, apart from being uh, having labs in South Kensington, um, we, are, we have the National Industrial Translation Center for Synthetic Biology called Simbi City, which is based on the new uh, Imperial White City campus, actually in this building, the so-called IHUB building, we have a whole, whole floor here uh, for this um, Industrial Translation Center. And we work uh, very closely in terms of industrial translation with uh, the leading um, synthetic biology research centers, which are shown here in, in this slide. So Manchester, Warwick, Bristol, uh, Edinburgh, um, Cambridge University and Imperial College itself in terms of the, the main research centers. All of these centers uh, carry out basic research in different areas. So Cambridge focuses very heavily with the John Innes Center on agroscience, for example, um, all of these centers uh, then feed their basic basic research through uh, Simbi City uh, into, into the uh, industrial domain. And so we, we work a lot with uh, business and industrial uh, startups um, and small and medium sized enterprises, as well as large companies uh, in terms of this industrial translation. And this slide, which is rather busy, just shows uh, a number of the companies that we, we, we work with. Uh, the ones that are underlined here are companies where we put a lot of effort into them. And uh, some of these companies are, are becoming really very successful now. 
So I want you to think of synthetic biology as uh, essentially platform technology, which uh, covers a range of fields. And that is shown here in terms of uh, the diff uh, some examples of the different fields. So diagnostics, therapeutics, uh, bioremediation, biomaterials, et cetera. And the same technology essentially works across these different fields. So let me talk a bit about some key applications. And so this slide uh, just shows uh, some examples of the modern uses of biology today. So agriculture, uh, use in the brewing industry, in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, food areas, materials areas, and all, all of these areas are now beginning to be af affected by uh, synthetic biology. Also, um, synthetic biology has the ability to be able to take waste products, so uh, landfill waste and, uh, you know, if you like, waste through the uh, petrochemical industry, and to go through synthetic biology to produce this whole range of products. And as I say, this is a very rapidly developing field. I should have mentioned perhaps that in the UK, we are currently talking about 150 companies that are working in this area, some of which are becoming uh, really quite successful, but of course, worldwide, a much larger number of companies. So I wanted to single out uh, two or three examples here. The first example is uh, synthetic spider silk. So this is the ability to be able to produce uh, spider silk syn synthetically using syn synthetic biology techniques. Basically, um, the, uh, uh, the genome of um, two, two spiders, two types of spiders, the Di Darwin spider and the orb spider, uh, were sequenced and uh, the secrets of the genome were worked out. And then uh, yeast, as it says on the slide here, was programmed uh, to produce uh, synth synthetic spider silk. Now, this, why this is a very exciting area is because as it says on the slide, uh, spider silk has uh, a tensile strength, which is uh, depending on the, the particular spider type of spider silk, between two and five times greater than steel and a fraction of its weight. So it's a really interesting, uh, if you like, area. And at the bottom of the slide here, I've quoted two companies, AM Silk and Airbus Industries. AM Silk are one of the companies that produce uh, synth synthetic uh, spider silk, and they are now working with Airbus Industries uh, to look at uh, uh, bio-based materials using spider silk uh, for the production of, uh, for example, airframe. And you can see that uh, if you can build and design and build aircraft which uh, use spider silk instead of the, uh, the, the more traditional materials, then what is gonna happen is the weight of the aircraft will come down dramatically and that will have a significant uh, effect in terms of the environment. Other areas uh, for synthetic spider silk, uh, this is from uh, Bolt Threads, uh, which is a US company and just shows uh, an early example of producing um, silk ties using spider silk approaches. And sim similarly, Adidas have now made trainers using spider silk. Um, it might be worth saying that um, the way it works is that uh, it turns out that uh, the spider silk comes out uh, from the yeast in liquid form and then uh, industrial techniques, which are essentially borrowed, borrowed from the nylon industry, allow you to produce uh, the spir spider silk threads. So that, that has represented a rapid development in terms of this area. The second area that I wanted to just touch upon was uh, the whole uh, dyeing industry. And if you can read this slide, it just says that the dyeing industry is one of the largest water consumers in the world uses over 5 trillion litres per year, along with petrochemical dyes and a host of other toxic and polluting chemicals that go into this mix. So this, so this is a real problem, actually. And uh, one example of this is, uh, is genes. So 1.2 billion pairs of genes are produced each year. And you can see from the slide, these are the toxic dyes that you know, put into the water supply in various countries, for example, dare I say it, China. And so this again is a problem in terms of uh, uh, pollution. And this is where uh, two of our companies uh, that we've, we've worked with and developed uh, are playing what, are, what is now a key role. Uh, this, this is the first of these companies originally called Custom Mem. Uh, 
uh, actually came directly out of our, of our research center now called Pure Affinity. And on the basis of originally a student project, uh, we were able to develop these, this company and to be able to produce um, on the basis of synthetic biology techniques, much more active uh, filtering processes than, uh, than uh, uh, carbon. And there's an example shown here, and there are different uh, versions of this of these pellets, which go into a filtration system depending on the application area. And of course, this is all biodegradable. And the second area, uh, second company that I wanted to talk about was Colorfix. Um, so Colorfix are um, a again a Cambridge-based company, but uh, again used uh, SymbiCity to as part of its development. Uh, still, we're still in close contact with them, and they produce um, non non toxic non toxic dyes. Um, uh, so, an example is shown here. Uh, this is done by DNA sequencing, which where we uh, managed to define the instruction set, and then um, on the basis of microorganisms, we can we can program the microorganism to produce different kinds of dyes. And I say these dyes are non-toxic. Non and again, Colorifix is a, a company which is rapidly growing. So there are, there are some examples, two or three examples of um, uh, where synthetic biology companies which uh, are developing in, in terms of these examples, mainly from in, through Imperial, um, but many, many other companies uh, are now beginning to have uh, positive effects on the environment. So now I want to just drill down a bit more into some more detail actually on uh, how these techniques are developing. And one of the uh, key areas that uh, is developing is laboratory automation and what are called biofoundries because uh, molecular biology and certainly synthetic biology uh, is now much more systematic. That, that's what's happening uh, very rapidly. And as a result of this, um, in many areas of the world, particularly the United States, the term synthetic biology is now being used syn uh, synonymously with another term, which is engineering biology. So I'm now going to kind of switch into using the term engineering biology. And this slide just shows uh, the, um, the, the four stages of uh, uh, engineering biology, starting off with the characterization of the individual parts which or components which are used in the uh, genetic circuits, then going through biofoundries, which are these big automation areas of which we have one, and then going through optimization into industrialization. And I'm going to really just talk about these three last areas, two, three, and four. So starting off with biofoundries where there is now intensive use of, uh, of, of automation. Uh, so the automation is based upon uh, uh, what we would call workflow and data acquisition. So associated with the biofoundry, we acquire a lot of data about the components and the gene circuits and how they work within uh, particular types of cells to produce these products that I talked about earlier. So here's an example of our, um, our foundry. I'll just run this, the video. Uh, as I say, much of what we do now is, uh, is, is about programming robots so that they work um, uh, automatically. And this allows you to get much more systematic results, but also uh, to be able to run these robots 24-7 uh, if you need to. And so this allows us to be able to uh, really implement the design, build, test, and learn paradigm in a way that has never been possible before, because now we're using intense, the intensive use of robots, which uh, we can program uh, to carry out all the functions which were previously, or most of the functions at the moment, which were previously carried out by humans. And that takes us back to the so-called design, build, test cycle, where we start off with specifications, we go through, de go through design, we then do a lot of computer modeling, and then we go into the wet lab and we do the build and test, and then debug and learn and go around this cycle again. Uh, for those people who are technically interested, this is a, a biological AND gate. So it's the direct equivalent to an AND gate in a computer, but it's biological. And so the background to all of this is um, many years of work actually now uh, where we've developed uh, information systems to support the design. So this is our information system, which is called Synbis. 
and uh, this allows you to uh, define and characterize all of these uh, uh, biological parts in great detail. I won't go through this in any detail, but for each individual part, there are now, for example, about 12 pages of detail on their design, how they're used, et cetera, et cetera. And what is happening internationally now is that uh, there is a confederation of databases, uh, which can be accessed by our information system, uh, which, has, which have uh, a whole uh, series of libraries of parts uh, or as, as they're called here, toolkits. So here are just some examples. CIDA is, or, is the um, uh, components uh, library, which, is, uh, which was produced and is being produced by Boston University, for example. Now, I want to change tack here slightly and talk about uh, a, a topic which uh, I'm sure is of great interest at the moment. In fact, uh, it's, it's an obsession almost by the media. So that, that's vaccines. This slide, <coughs> interestingly, I gave a talk in 2013 to friends and uh, I talked a bit about uh, uh, MERS or Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Um, at, at that time, uh, this was considered to be a potential problem in the Middle East because it was related to SARS, uh, but it didn't really affect the Western world. But nevertheless, it was there. And then, sorry, and then also in 2013, May 2013, this is a quote from The Economist, and I just raised this at the time, if a new and deadly strain of influenza were to arise, putting together a vaccine against it, in the least possible time would be a priority. So you can see at that time, people were, were aware of this, but nevertheless, the focus was on influenza rather than uh, unfortunately COVID-19. This is a slide, which is uh, from uh, an article this week, actually, 23rd of uh, September, 2020, um, from the Financial Times. It's free, it's worth reading, and it talks about the different kinds of vaccines that everybody is trying to develop. So what I'm going to do now is to take you through an example of the way in which this will start to develop in terms of synthetic biology. Uh, and as I'm sure just about all of you must know, the, the focus in terms of vaccine, in terms of COVID-19, is um, well there are various kinds of vaccines but one of the interesting ones is the RNA vaccine uh, which is uh, being produced by Imperial College. Uh, RNA vaccines are interesting because the basic virus is, is, is an RNA structure rather than, rather than a DNA structure and it's these um, spikes uh, which are the focus of most of the research. How do you block uh, the activity of these spikes to transfer the virus into a human cell. And so the way that RNA vaccines work is that uh, you have the RNA, RNA sequence of the, uh, of the, um, uh, of the, of the um, virus. Uh, you code for antigens and proteins, and then the uh, antigens and proteins reassemble uh, in the pathogen. And so what we're doing is uh, working on the RNA sequence, uh, which goes through, through translation into host cells, encodes antigens, and then simulates the uh, human body's adaptive immune system to produce antibodies. That's the way that these RNA vaccines work. Uh, so people like Robin, Robin Shattuck at Imperial College have been working on these vaccines uh, for quite a long time now, and uh, some of them are getting into phase three trials. What we are interested in looking at, and uh, this won't have immediate impact, but hopefully it will have a um, greater impact in the future, is, is looking at uh, aspects of the, uh, the spikes, uh, the spike protein, which is the, the key components of these, uh, of, of these, um, uh, these vaccines and indeed the virus itself. And what we're interested in doing is using synthetic biology techniques to optimize the way in which vaccine, these RNA vaccines work. And so let me go through that. So here is the uh, coding sequence for the RNA vaccine. Uh, there are uh, actually two areas of the uh, the sequence the the so-called uh, five prime utr and the three prime utr uh, which are interesting areas which don't uh, directly 
um, influence the, 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 the vaccine in terms of its basic form. But what, it, what they do do is to affect the efficacy of the vaccine. And the way this works is that uh, we are now beginning to work in detail on the structure of the five prime and the three prime sections of the RNA vaccine to look at different combinations of uh, uh, components, uh, which will, as I say, increase the efficacy, the effectiveness of the, of the, of the vaccine. And it, it is well known in the literature that modification of these two areas of the, of the, of the, of the, the vaccine genome uh, will produce this effect. So each of these uh, parts of the, uh, of the, of the genome comprises a series of sub subunits and in the subunits there are variants at each stage. And so optimizing uh, sequences for greater efficacy is, is something that we're focusing on. Now I wanted to just explain how this works uh, by really showing you a, a slightly different example but one that uh, is pretty much fully worked up in terms of our labs. Uh, which is the whole whole uh, issue of lycopene. So lycopene is the uh, effectively the red uh, substance you see, bright red substance you see in uh, tomatoes and watermelons, and this is known to have um, uh, curative effects in terms of things like prostate cancer, etc. The problem is to get enough lycopene uh, for this purpose uh, uh, is difficult in terms of harvesting it, if you like, from uh, tomatoes, uh, watermelons, etc. And so we have been working on uh, how you would do this, how you do do it using synthetic biology techniques and looking at a, a synthetic pathway which is added to one of these bacteria, E. coli. And I want to take you through the, the basic way in which this is done. So what we did was to identify the basic so-called lycopene pathway uh, which in synthetic biology terms comprises a series of components, and these are shown here. Uh, so there's one, one promoter, three RBSs, uh, three coding sequences, and a terminator. That, that is the basic, basic pathway. We got the components from all the existing data sheets and uh, in, the, in terms of the databases, Symbis, as I said. Uh, so we identified five promoters which would be useful. We identified a number of RBSs, which will be useful. We identified a number of genes or coding sequences, which uh, would form the basis of the design. And um, that then uh, gave us a whole series of different components, which are shown in this slide, which we were able to um, put together in different sequences uh, of the basic, different combinations of the basic circuit uh, to produce uh, the, the lycopene output. Now, the problem is that when you do this, uh, when you take all those components together, there are 810 possible sequences which you can use, which even for a biofoundry is, is, is a bit of a stretch. And so how do you deal with this problem? How do you work out what combination of components you need to, to produce the highest output of lycopene? And that's what, what is meant by optimization. So the idea here is how do you produce an overall maximum or a global maximum as opposed to a local maximum? The way that this is typically done is in terms of so-called design space, uh, where uh, you can either go through one step at a time and look at the whole of the design space, or you can cover the whole of the design space. So this would be the 810 different combinations in terms of our example. Or you can uh, use a technique which is called design of experiments to be able to, to statistically determine which um, areas of the, or which combinations of components are interesting. And it's this one that we've applied. And we do that uh, by using one of our workflows. So we design the basic circuit, we then do the computer modeling. We then go through the design of experiments software and then build the, build the gene circuit. And when we do that, we do this actually, we, we've done this for 88 combinations. And uh, this slide just shows the different combinations of these components and the different outputs. And when you look at this, you can see that the up one, with one combination, you have 0.97 output in terms of calibrated units. And at the other end, you get 
over 500, 500 increase in terms of in in terms of uh, the yield in terms of the lycopene output and this is simply by taking a basic set of components and then rearranging them in different in different combinations based upon this uh, use of design of experiments so this is a very exciting area and it's the way in which we're going to apply this and now beginning to apply this to the five prime and three prime areas of the RNA vaccine. So finally, um, talk, I want to talk just briefly about industrial translation. So that's the third stage in this process because I've already said at the beginning of this talk that we want to produce a new industry. Um, cornerstones of industrial translation are standards, reproducibility, reliability, and as Rod said, I'm Professor of Biomedical Systems Engineering, so I'm an engineer, and uh, this is very much the sort of approach that all engineers use in terms of industrialization. And this is about going from R&D through systematic reproducibility through manufacturing, and you do this through process design, a wide range of data, and execution, and systematic operations. So I've already said that this, the standards, reproducibility and reliability are the cornerstones of this approach. And we've learned a lot from, in terms of synthetic biology, from the manufacturing of, auto, uh, of cars, the automotive industry, where the design of uh, management of complex, complexity with modularity is important. Computer-aided design is important. Automated measurement is very important. And we can now begin to do this through the biofoundries and then continuous improvement, so continuous analytics and process improvement and absolute reproducibility. Absolute reproducibility will probably not be entirely possible using biological systems uh, for many years, but this is the very definitely the strategy that is now being applied. And so the same objectives are applied now to engineering biology or synthetic biology. And so here is uh, an example of uh, a three series BMW, where the standard components are, are um, supplied by 50 uh, standard component manufacturers and BMW are now an assembly, represent an assembly uh, company. And this is what we're uh, working towards in terms of an ecosystem for synthetic biology. And that's shown here. So there are tools companies, there are parts companies, there are chassis companies and DNA sequencing and synthesis companies. These now, uh, are beginning to exist in quite large numbers as shown here. These are just some examples. And then that is surrounded by now by the development of information systems companies uh, for this whole biodesign ecosystem. So this is pretty much my last slide and it just shows that um, starting from the uh, beginning of synthetic biology, you can drive up the dry lab route uh, for more and more uh, modeling and optimization, or you can go down the wet lab, lab route. So starting off with manual design and wet lab biologists, uh, and then CAD and optimization, and then leading into biofoundries uh, and uh, CAD and foundries and optimization shows that we're, the whole field is driving towards greater reliability and reproducibility. Um, if you're interested in hearing more about um, uh, synthetic biology in more general terms, then you might want to uh, look at uh, or listen to uh, a version of the bottom line, which is uh, on the BBC Sounds website, where we talked about this early, in early January. There's, so there's a section on, there's a program on synthetic biology, which I was uh, pleased to uh, take part in. So thank you very much. <clears throat> Well, uh, thank you very much for that, Dick. Um, a lot to take in in a very short period of time. And thank you for that uh, terrific uh, gallop through. Um, one question occurred to me, which might be of interest to, to others attending, is in terms of uh, the way the college is working. The college is working on a number of different uh, initiatives, diagnostics, uh, vaccines, uh, at treatment. Is, is there a, a, a central core to that? Do you all meet up every six weeks or do you uh, just find other people working who have information that you need 
in yeah it, it's at the moment it's done on a pretty much an ad hoc basis although we know every, everyone but uh, for example robin chattock that's working on the basic rna vaccine um you know we we interact with we interact with him chemical engineering interacts with him so there are there are a series of key drivers um one of the things that um uh, our center has done uh, through my leadership my colleague paul fremont is to develop a, a really effective pcr test testing system which is very much based in synthetic biology and uh, uses one of our robots which um, costs about 80 pounds and uh, it can it can process a um, uh, uh, thousand patients if I can talk in terms of hospitals uh, patients and staff a thousand a thousand patients and staff uh, per day and uh, because it's based on PCR it's very it's extremely reliable and uh, so, so uh, we are now trying to really promote that as a, as a uh, not exactly as an alternative, but as an adjunct to the main testing uh, systems that are ongoing. So, and then of course, Chris Tumazu is also developing an alternative method, which is based upon his uh, uh, so-called DNA nudge technology, which um, uh, sequences DNA by taking a swab. Um, so there are a whole series of different groups that are work working um, in a different guise. Uh, before, I, before I got into synthetic biology, I was very involved in medical imaging and uh, started an Imperial College spin-out company called Visbian, uh, which is now uh, really quite successful. And we've, we've supplied all the imaging technology for the Nightingale Hospital. So the college is very involved in, in, the, um, in the development of uh, how we're dealing with COVID-19. Thank you very much. Uh, we've had uh, one question, maybe two questions. Um, uh, before we go on there, John Evans, do you think we, you would like to demute people and people to uh, join the discussion with the video on? Um, I, I, initially, that was a good idea. I think it's more controlled uh, and manageable from your point of view, asking the question, Rod if um, you just read them from the chat, because then everyone, okay. you can see what's there and everyone else can see what people have been asking. Right, well, uh, I think everybody else can see from uh, John Bassendine is asking um, if there's a method to remove neonicotinoids uh, from the outflows into rivers as they kill aquatic life. Have you been uh, had any involvement in that area, Dick? Um, I, I personally haven't, but um, one of the companies that uh, I touched upon is, the, is this company, which is now called Pure Affinity. And uh, Pure Affinity, which, uh, as I said, originally started off as a, a so-called iGEM project, but we developed into, into a company, uh, developed filtration methods. And these filtration methods um, are now very sophisticated and use um, synthetic biology techniques to target different types of toxins. So I think if if uh, if you look on the um, if you look on the Pure Affinity website, uh, you should be able to find something uh, in that area. Um, yeah. <clears throat> right. Thank you. And. Um... Alan Grant has, uh, oh, Bill Blackburn. Alan Grant has said, how, how might SynBio build in biodegradable to industrial plastics in the future? Um, well, that actually... Ah, right. Yeah, in that's... Other, a... In other words, we, 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 use, we use rubbish to create something that turns itself back into rubbish, which is, is, is uh, not a problem in the environment. Is that the basis of that question? Uh... Well, there, I think there are two basic answers to, to that uh, uh, quickly. Uh, the first is that um, there are now uh, synthetic biology solutions around for breaking down various types of plastics. Uh, some of some of the um, um, to turn them from uh, uh, bio uh, bio non degradable plastics into biodegradable plastics. And uh, again, that that's a project um, which is. Um, uh, ongoing um, uh, work, working with some of the waste companies to be able to do that. Um, but also um, there are companies around and I just can't think of the name of them at the moment, but I can reply to this maybe in a written form where 
uh, the uh, synthetic biology techniques are being used to actually design plastics which um, uh, can be triggered to become biodegradable at a particular a particular point. Um, you know, there's, there's a technique which is called a kill switch, uh, and what this means is basically that uh, you you can actually program into into the design uh, the ability to be able to send a signal, a biological signal, at whatever point you want it to degrade, so that the 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 um, uh, the plastic degrades, but it doesn't just simply degrade down to a, a basic form. It actually uh, basically breaks down completely. And, that, and that's a pretty exciting development. And uh, uh, I just can't think of the name of the company. It's a UK company that's making great inroads into this. Um, it's something I brought to the attention of the government recently, actually. Well, that's interesting. Thank you. And uh, Bill Blackburn, one of the uh, committee members, uh, is... Uh, posted a question here saying hello. And uh, you previously me mentioned that there was a move to publish the basic information equivalent to open source software. Is that what, uh, is that the case across the research groups? And will that continue? Yeah, they will continue on that. Sorry, yeah. No, you carry on. No, I was gonna say, that's what I meant by these toolkits, really, that I know I, I agree I covered quite a lot of ground today, but um, the, the basic toolkits are, are open access. Um, so the, there is really quite a wide range of, of biological components now that, uh, you know, I'm talking about hundreds of different kinds of components that sit in these federated databases and are open access. Right. And John Bassendine is uh, going to chase up on uh, pure affinity and thanks for mentioning it. Uh, what Rob Williams has asked a question here, is there a way to capture recycle and recycle uh, CO2 from the air into useful products? Yes, uh, there, there, there is. Uh, um, the, the, the company they need that, uh, John, you said John said that asked that question. Um, the company that you need to have a look at is a company called Lanzatech. Uh, so Lanzatech um, actually uh, have developed industrial processes now. They're, they're, they're becoming quite big. Uh, they started off in New Zealand. We Again, we were very involved with them at the beginning, uh, well, until fairly recently, but they've now moved to the United States. And what Lanzatech, uh, actually the University of Nottingham is still very involved with them. Um, they, they actually capture, they use CO2, they go through uh, something called an extremophile, which is a particular kind of uh, um, bacterium, and that allows them to use these uh, synthetic biology techniques to capture the CO2 and to actually turn it into products. So look up Lanzatech. Thank you, Dick. Well, I think we're going to uh, think about just some closing comments now and thanking you particularly and thanking everybody for attending. Uh, the, uh, I'd like to say that uh, we had, as many of you will know, and many of you will have contributed, uh, we were fundraising during the summer to keep ourselves going as we were having no uh, ticket income, uh, which is the normal way we survive. We set ourselves a target of uh, 5,000 pounds and when I checked about an hour ago, we had already got 4,786. So we're about 214 pounds short uh, to, of our target. So if anybody felt uh, motivated to uh, put a fiver in or 10, 10 pounds in, we'd meet that, which allows us to uh, continue with confidence uh, during the autumn. Uh, we will be launching our uh, autumn program. You just go to our website and, and um, you'll find out where you can donate. Uh, we're launching our autumn program in uh, a couple of weeks' time. Uh, the first, th first event will be Professor Helen Ward, a clinical professor of public health. He, she'll be giving her analysis of the coronavirus, and that's on the 6th of October at our usual time of 7 o'clock in the evening. Uh, following that, we have Professor Artu Rajinti, uh, uh, finished professor at the college on the Thursday, the 22nd of October. And uh, he'll be talking about what we have learned, particularly what he has learned uh, from the discovery of the Higgs boson. And we've got many more exciting things uh, following that. So thank you once again for attending. 
and uh, if, if we were all released, uh, are unmuted, we all could all give you a clap of appreciation, uh, Jack. Indeed. Thanks very much. Look forward to seeing you again soon.